Okay, good afternoon. So, uh, I will talk to you a little bit about some work that we did in the you know, last uh, couple of years on merging uh, structural optimization and finite element analysis using OpenSys to sort of to be able to solve uh, interesting problems. And I have a number of collaborators that are listed here. Frank helped quite a bit, and PhD student Quang Wu, Yong Yi, Michele Barbato. And a lot of what I'm going to, to show you, the example, uh, they are in this uh, paper that was published in 2012. So if you, if you want more detail, you can, can go to this paper. So <coughs> I'm going to first uh, you know, motivate why we did this and then sh show you some uh, simple application example. So the uh, need for finite element-based optimization in structural and geotechnical engineering. You all know that the finite element method has now become a very powerful tool for modeling, simulation of structural uh, system or geostructures. And numerical optimization has always been used in many engineering applications. I've listed some of the application here. Uh, the one that I underline, I will show you an example a little bit later. So we, we can be interested in standard order optimization or structural reliability analysis. I think many of you probably uh, have studied reliability analysis. The methods that are based on, uh, on a design point, most likely failure point, require optimization. Uh, Reliability-based optimization, which has kind of two layers of optimization. Uh, probabilistic performance-based optimum seismic design. I'll show you an example at the end. Finite element model calibration or updating, system identification. So, you know, it's very natural to think about uh, merging finite element with, uh, with uh, optimization. And, and it has been done a long time ago. There are a number of uh, famous examples. There is the optimization software Tosca that was integrated with Abacus but mainly to solve a lot of engineering, uh, mechanical engineering problem. You know, to minimize the weight of uh, mechanical component of, of uh, automotive structures or airspace structures. Then uh, Nastra, ANSI, CLS Dyna, they have a computational uh, optimization tool, but mainly also to optimize mechanical components, not so much uh, civil structures. So what, what is inherent to the optimization problem for structural uh, geotechnical engineering? Well, they are complex in nature. They, they involve uh, large-scale finite element model uh, of uh, structural or geotechnical systems. They require optimization of different system properties. You could, for example, optimize for not having natural frequency in a certain frequency range or having the mode shapes of a certain shape, optimize the damping properties, or the inelastic response behavior at the global or local level. You would like your pushover curve to have cert you know, certain properties, or you would like, uh, when you do response history analysis, that certain features of displacement velocity acceleration uh, you know, remain below certain critical threshold. So the objective functions and the constraint function, they can be interchanged. So it's a weight, initial cost, life cycle cost. Now if you're interested in performance-based earthquake engineering, you can use the attributes that are computed from performance-based earthquake engineering, like demand hazard curve, uh, mean annual rate of exceeding a certain limit state, the loss hazard curve, and the constraint can be formulated in terms of uh, displacement, deformation, force, and, and you can switch. So you can, let's say, minimize the weight for a certain, uh, let's say, maximum probability of failure that you don't want to, to exceed, or you can minimize the probability of failure for a, certain, for a given weight. So <coughs> obviously that 
there is a need, we, we thought that there was a need for a finite element optimization framework that is very general, very flexible, able to accommodate a wide range of, of problems. And you already know that OpenSys is great because you, you have a structural element and, and, and soil element under the same umbrella. So you can uh, model soil foundation structure interaction system and so on. And this finite element uh, framework of optimization framework should be able to, uh, once it's developed, re readily incorporate any new development that would be done in the area of structural analysis or in the area of computational optimization and so on. So the idea to couple OpenSeas with a powerful uh, optimization package you know, came to mind and at, uh, we decided to use SNOT that I will say a few words about here. SNOP stands for Sparse Nonlinear Optimization and uh, it's a general purpose nonlinear optimization code with sequential quadratic programming. Uh, it was developed by these three individuals here who I think at some point were both three at Stanford. They wrote one or two book on computational optimization that you, you may know. Now Professor Philip Gill is at UCSD. That's how I, I got to know him and uh, and uh, the student, my student took some of his classes and so on, we realized that SNOP was a very good tool to do that. And uh, what are the advantages of SNOP for structural and geotechnical engineering? It's specifically designed for large scale application. It, it tolerates discontinuities in the gradient of the objective function and the constraint function. Uh, it uh, requires usually fewer evaluation of the objective and the constraint function than uh, optimization software that do not use SQT. And the objective function or the constraint function, it's like running the nonlinear finite element code, so it can take many hours. So it's very good to, to have an algorithm that do not require too many, too many function calls. It also has some nice properties that uh, for example, in reliability, in, in uh, structural reliability analysis, if you want to converge to the design point, uh, if you go and you start to have iterative points that are deep in the failure domain, then you may not converge there. You may not have a solution. So the algorithm breaks down. So it, 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 uh, it's not has some techniques that allows to avoid the region where the objective and the constraint function cannot be evaluated. And also it has a number of options that the user can, you know, can uh, uh, adjust to improve the, the performance of the optimization process for specific problem. So here I'm showing you a few slides on the, the software architecture. And I, I'm not very knowledgeable about the object-oriented programming I learned with the students, so I will not go in too many details, just look at the, the, the main features. So the key in doing this merger was to wrap SNOP as a class in OpenSeas, as, as a class, optimization class, that can effectively communicate with all the other classes of OpenSeas. And immediately, so you see the SNOP class here, which is a subclass of the the base optimization class. And if somebody wanted to put another optimization package in OpenSeas, it would be here. It would be a, you know, optimization two, and so on. And uh, you, you see the member functions and the, the variables. Uh, immediately, uh, we realize that there are several different applications of optimization. You can have standalone optimization, or you can have optimization within reliability analysis to find the design point. And there was already in OpenSeas, a, a, uh, that you may be aware of, there was already a toolbox for reliability analysis. Uh, and that toolbox has already some optimization algorithm to find the design point. So we wanted to also offer the option to use SNOP to find the design point. 
So that's a, that's a, a second uh, application. So these are kind of subclasses of, of this one. And we are very interested in what is called reliability-based optimization, where you are, there are two layers of optimization, one to find the design point, and then one to do the global optimization around. So there would be a third, a third subclass here, if you wish. And you can see that when we do a standalone optimization, we talk about design variables. But when we do reliability analysis, the design variables, they are uh, here, I left them DB, but they are random variables, basically. And the limit state function, the, the, the constraint function in standalone optimization, the constraint function for, for reliability analysis, we call it the limit state function. So you see this main structure. Now we focus on, on the, the one that was for reliability analysis. Focus on, on this one, and then I will focus a little bit on this one. So in OpenSeas, we already have a, a uh, module for reliability analysis developed by Professor Dirk Jurgen and, and, and Hokas, the student Hokas, who is now a, a professor at, at, uh, in Canada. And uh, let me give you some information that could be useful. So it was the first implementation of reliability in OpenSea with the reliability analysis class, reliability domain, random variable, limit state function, probability transformation. Uh, then uh, Michael Scott and uh, Terji Hokas, they improved the finite element parametrization framework in OpenSea. They, they developed a very elegant framework that allows to keep track of all, any parameter of the finite element model, geometric parameter, material parameters, and update them, right? which is what you need to do to optimize or to find the design point. So uh, they de developed this, uh, this parameterization framework. And when we connected SNOP to OpenSeas, we, we made it consistent with this parameterization framework. So it uses this parameterization framework. Then here, this is the one for standalone uh, optimization. So we, we are, here we do, we do not call about, talk about random variable, but design variable, and uh, design variable positioner. So we have the vector of all the design variable that we, with respect to which we optimize, and we need at every iteration of the optimization to redistribute them to the finite element model you know, to the geometric properties, the material properties, and do a new run of the finite element model. And here again, you can see the two standalone optimization and reliability, a flow chart. So if you follow the number one, two, three, four, five, in blue, you have like one iteration for a standalone optimization. You can see that the SNOP library gives some, let's say, the third iteration gives some value of the parameters, the design variables, that are passed through the design variable position to the finite element model in OpenSeas. And then this finite element is run with these new variables. And then from the response of the finite element model, we can evaluate the objective function and the gradient of the objective function and the constraint function. And then they are passed back to the uh, SNOP, to the optimization algorithm. That will, based on the function evaluation and the gradient, decide on the next set of values. And uh, the very similarly to, uh, for reliability, uh, for optimization to find the design point. So the what are the distinguishing features of this uh, extended framework, OpenSea SNOP? So it has very advanced capabilities to solve opti complex optimization problems. Because in OpenSea, as, as you, you have learned, with the library of material elements, 
non-linear non solution strategies, you can solve some pretty, pretty complex and large-scale problems. And uh, any parameter that you use to define a finite element model in OpenSys, you can define it as a design variable for optimization or a random variable for reliability analysis. And any finite element uh, model input parameter or finite element response quantity that you compute in OpenSys can be used to formulate the objective function or the constraint function or the limit state function. And it's very powerful. You can write in Tickle your objective function based on the response uh, quantities from your finite element model. And if you also need, let's say, capacity quantities, like the, the capacity inflection of a beam that will depend on the amount of steel, the yield strength of the steel, the geometry, then these are input finite element parameters. You can, in Tickle, write the formula that gives you the, let's say, bending moment capacity. And then you have demand and capacity and you can write your limit state function directly in Tickle. And something also important, I don't know if somebody gave a talk on uh, the direct differentiation method yesterday, maybe? No? Okay, so let me say a few words about this. There are several team of researchers, Professor De Kurgan and his student, uh, myself at UCSD with some student, Michael Scott as well and others who have implemented in OpenSeas a very powerful method to compute the sensitivity of any response quantity with respect to geometric parameters, material parameters, load parameters. Not using finite difference. The, the, the brute force method of doing it is you, using finite difference. You, you do a finite element run with theta, then you change theta to theta plus delta theta, you do, do a new finite element run, you subtract the two solution, divide by delta theta. So that's finite difference. It's very computationally expensive and not so accurate. The direct differentiation method, it's analytical. It consists of differentiating exactly the, no, the finite element algorithm with respect to the parameter theta. And once you converge for the response, it requires doing more computation, and then you, you, you have the response sensitivity. And they are, they are exact in the sense that this is the exact sensitivity of the finite element response, which is not you know, the truth. You know that the finite element response is a numerical approximation of the true solution that we don't know. But at least it's consistent. You, you, you have the exact sensitivity of the finite element response using DDM, direct differentiation method. It requires a lot of analytical work for every material parameter, every element, and then you program it, debug it, and then you can use it. And uh, when you implement new element, new material, you need to extend the formulation to have DDM. So in OpenSeas, there are a number of material models that have this uh, extension and, and the number of elements. So this uh, framework is very efficient because if or each of the parts, not in OpenSeas, are very efficient and the communication between the two, which has been developed like I showed you using object-oriented programming, is, is very efficient too. And this framework can also readily call existing software or user-defined executable program. For example, for the fourth example that I showed you, we do all the performance-based earthquake engineering calculation. You know, the demand hazard analysis, the, the reliability analysis, the loss hazard analysis. We typically do this in MATLAB. So you, you can, you know, uh, call MATLAB from, from uh, OpenSea SNOP or vice versa. And then this framework, uh, big advantage like I already mentioned, anytime you have new development in OpenSea or in computational optimization or in probabilistic reliability method, immediately you, you can inject that in, in the framework and have a new, a new version. So now I'm going to show you a sequence of, of, of a simple example, but very, ni very nice illustration. So the first one, standalone structural optimization. So this would be <coughs> the problem of a steel electrical power, transmission power, 
subjected to wind load, simplified wind load. So you see it's a five story, 15 meter tall, the base six meter by six meter, two meter by two meter tall. It's a three dimensional frame, but all the members are bolted, so it behaves very much like a three dimensional truss. So we modeled it as a three dimensional truss with only truss elements, uniaxial truss elements. Every truss element, the material constitutive model, we use Menegato Pinto, but asymmetric, you see, just to indirectly capture uh, the effect of backing. We have a smaller uh, yield stress in compression than in, in tension. And the wind loads, they are applied only at the top, a, a quasi static load at an angle of 30 degrees with the axis X of the structure. And we consider two types of intensity, serviceability load, where each of these four forces is 25 kilonewton, ultimate load, each of the two is 100 kilonewton. And then we have three types of, of truss element, A, B, C, A the column, B the diagonal, and C the horizontal members. And we assume that all the columns are A, all the diagonals are B, and all the horizontal elements are C. So we have only three optimization variables to, to simplify the, the problem a little bit. Like, it's a little bit academic because of this simplification, but you see cross-section area A, B, C, we give a range, a lower bound, an upper bound, which is reasonable for, from an engineering viewpoint, and then an initial values which typically in the engineering world would come from the experience of the engineer, maybe some simplified analysis. And then the numerical optimization problem here is we want to minimize the total volume of the steel. You see, multiplying the cross-section by the length of the element, summing over all the column, all the diagonal element, all the horizontal element. So this is the volume. We want to minimize the volume subjected to constraint that this cross-section area, they have a lower bound and upper bound, and two other constraints, that the displacement of node G at the top of this node cannot exceed 1.5 centimeter for the serviceability load and 15 centimeter for the ultimate load. And by using snopped open seas, we found the solution here, A1, A2, A3. A3 corresponds to the lower bound. And the total volume went from 1.2 cubic meter of steel to 0 0.274. And you see here the objective function, starting at 1.2 cubic meter, as a function of the number of iteration of the optimization process. You see, it took 40 iterations to converge. And here we are showing the pushover curve due to the wind, right? the total wind force versus the maximum displacement at point G. So for the initial parameter values, very, very bulky. You see, it's linear elastic here for 400 kilonewton. Right? And then we stop at 20 iteration, this point here gives the red curve. So we start to have a lot of inelasticity for the ultimate load. And then at the, at the final uh, optimization point here, this is the black one. You see we reach 15 centimeters of displacement. And there is a lot of inelastic behavior, but we have reduced a lot the, the volume, and therefore the cost of, of the tower. Uh, here also, for the optimization, we use both finite difference and DDM. And, and both gave the same results. Uh, so. How long does it take to do the simulation? To optimize here? Yeah. Well, very, very quickly. Uh, I would say, I don't remember the exact, but probably maybe 15 minutes. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So now I'm going to show you a nonlinear finite element model updated. So let's see how much time we have. So uh, 
as you know, when you have a finite element model, and let's say you have experimental results, you would like to tune, let's say, the model parameters to capture as closely as possible, let's say, the time history that we're recording. So this is a soil column of three main layers of clay. See, material number one, number two, number three. Each of the, the clay uh, material is modeled using the multi-yield surface J2 plasticity model that probably Professor Brino this morning talked to you about that is available in open seas. We modeled here a soil column from the ground surface to 17 meter, meters below uh, the ground surface. And we use a quadrilateral two-dimensional uh, uh, element with uh, assuming plane strain condition. And then every node, these two nodes are constrained to have the same horizontal displacement, same vertical, same here, so that we force this to be what is called the shear column, the kinematics of a shear column. And we, we used as base, uh, base acceleration a, ground, a time history from a downhole array at 17 meter depth uh, in China, in the Lotung array during an earthquake in 1986. And here we cheated a little bit. What I'm going to show you, we did not use experimental data. We, we, we selected these material parameters. So, so for these material parameters here, the two main parameters are the low strain shear modulus and the shear stress, the, the shear strength. So we took those as the, as the truth. We simulated the response due to this measured acceleration. And then we took this as, if you wish, the experimental data. Right? Because here we wanted to check exactly that our snot open seas can recover the exact, solu the, you know, the exact solution. So now we simulated, and we had a very good understanding of in the simulated experimental result, how much inelasticity was in the soil. So you see there is quite a bit of inelasticity here. And now what we did, we formulated the problem of uh, finite element model abating. So the objective function is the sum over all the station where you want to match the time history, here three. And then for each station, it's the sum over all the time step of the square of the difference between the finite element prediction and the experimental result. Here that we simulate the experimental result and the square. And then we put constraint on the parameter of the three soil layers, the initial uh, shear modulus larger than 20,000 and the shear strength larger than 20. And then the method, you can compute the gradient always by finite difference in open seas. It's always available by finite difference. Or method two, the smart method, direct differentiation method. So you see here how it would work, the direct differentiation method. You take this function here, you differentiate it with respect to theta. So two times one half is one, and the chain rule of differentiation. So the parentheses multiply by the derivative of this, with respect to theta. And now this open seas has, as I told you, the capability to compute this using the direct differentiation method. So here you will see it makes a big difference. So now you see the results. Right? We have three layers, initial shear modulus, shear strength. This is the truth, the reference value, or if you want the true values. We started away from them. Not, I mean, reasonably, like a good engineer would, would have some you know, reasonable initial values here. And then if you use finite difference, you would converge to these updated values and DDM to these. So bo both of them are, are very close to, to the true values. And the, the DDM are closer. And if you look at the graphically what it means, the blue is the experimental result that we simulated. And then the red is the simulated response using the initial 
value of, of the parameters before finite element model update. So you see the time history is very different. And then here they match exactly. In this case, which is a, a little bit manufactured again because we don't have exact experimental data, we, we simulated them. Right? You see the objective function goes from 398 to pretty much zero. And this is an interesting plot because it shows you how the objective function decreases. So how the matching between the, the simulated and the experimental increases as a function of the number of iterations. So if you use finite difference, you have the blue. If you use the, the uh, DDM, you have the red. DDM usually allows you to be more robust, more efficient in, in the optimization. Now a structural reliability analysis. So we have a reinforced concrete frame, two story, two base, subjected to a pushover load, P, P over two inverted triangular. And this is, we have fiber discretization, we model every beam, every column with three displacement base element, I think with four gauss point each. And uh, you see the dimensions here. And we have, for the column, we assume, we model the difference between confined concrete and unconfined concrete. For the beam, everything is unconfined. And we have a total of 11 material parameters. You see the compressive strength, the strain at the maximum uh, strength in the concrete, uh, the residual, the residual uh, stress, the strain at the corresponding residuals, residual stress, and so on. So uh, four, let me see, one, two, three, four for the confined concrete, three for the unconfined because the residual stress is zero for the unconfined concrete. And for the rebars, they are modeled with the Manigato Pinto model with the three parameters, Young's modulus, strain, uh, hardening ratio, and the yield stress. And so we have all these parameters. And the load P for the pushover is also modeled as a random variable. Now the mean value that we use and the coefficient of variation for the material parameters is very realistic. It comes from papers of people who have studied this from a lot of samples. Now, I'm sorry for those of you who do not know the, the theory of structural reliability, maybe you all do, but when you find what is called the design point that allows you to compute the probability of failure, to have an, an approximation of the probability of failure, you do not work with the basic random variable that I would call x. See the physical variable here. You transform them into some variable y that are standard norm using, using a probability transformation. So we do the optimization in what is called the y space. So in the y space or in the standard normal space, we want to find the point in the failure domain that is closest to the origin. So we want to, this is the objective function. We want to minimize the distance between a point and the origin. Cons uh, with the constraint that this point must be on the limit state function. So it must be in the failure domain. So now the constraint function in structural reliability analysis is called the limit state function. And here we formulate it like this. 14.4 centimeters minus the roof displacement. Now if the limit state function is negative, it means the roof displacement is larger than 14.4 centimeters we call it failure here. Why did we choose 14.4? Because it corresponds to 2% roof drift ratio, which is, you know, a, a pretty large roof drift ratio where the structure is in pretty bad shape. And we, we solve this, so we solve this using uh, open C snob, find a reliability index of 2.09, and therefore a probability of failure of 1.8%. Then, we did Monte Carlo simulation. You also can do this in open seas. To verify this number, I think we ran maybe 50,000 realization. We found 1.85%. So, so it's, it shows that this was a pretty accurate estimate of the probability of failure. 
And then uh, some interesting result here. This is the pushover curve by P, P, the displacement on the roof, no, either at the first story or on the roof. Right, so here, first story, roof, where, where when you put all the material parameters equal to their mean values. Remember the mean values of the load I didn't mention was 150 kilonewton. So when you have the mean value of the load and you put all the mean values of the parameters, you, you have these two curves here. When you replace the value of the parameters by what is called the design point values, which are, again, can be interpreted nicely as the most likely values of all the material parameters that will make the structure reach 14.4 centimeter on the roof. Then you see the load becomes maybe 220 kilonewton and the, the curve are very different. And so that's, you can interpret this as the most likely scenario that will create a displacement of 14.4 centimeters on the roof. Okay, so now the last one. Do I have a few more minutes? Uh, two? Maybe I will use three here. Okay, so very quickly, in performance-based earthquake engineering, you know how it works, right? You define a structure, you assume that you have a seismic hazard curve for the side, then you use the fundamental period of the structure, you take the spectral acceleration at the fundamental period as an intensity measure, then you take an ensemble of, of ground motion record, you scale them at this intensity measure for a certain hazard level, and then you repeat many time history analysis in open seas, you look at response quantities called engineering demand parameters, and you look at their probability distribution. Then you convolve with the seismic hazard curve, you have the demand hazard curve. Then you define the fragility function for certain failure mechanism, like uh, flexural shear failure of the bottom of a bridge pier, or shear failure, or unseating of, of, right? So now you convolve the fragility curve with the demand hazard curve, and you have the annual probability of exceeding certain limit states. Then you go further, you, you assume that the repair cost is a random variable, it has uncertainty. You take this uncertainty into account and you keep propagating the, the, un the uncertainties to compute what is called a loss hazard curve, right? where you have the annual probability of exceedance with the repair cost. So you pick a repair cost, say this one, you come here, let's say we are here, this one here, 10 minus three, means on the, average, on the average, the reciprocal of 10 minus 3 is 1,000. So on the average, every 1,000 years, I will have this repair cost for this bridge, if it's a bridge. And so that's the end of the thing, the loss hazard curve. Now what we want to do with small open seas is not performance-based earthquake engineering analysis, but performance-based earthquake engineering design. How should you design your structure so that it has a loss hazard curve, to make it, a, it's a little bit extreme what I'm saying, but so that it has a loss hazard curve like the owner of the building would like. The owner, the stakeholders, they can discuss this forever. What is the shape of this loss hazard curve that they want to have? Now the engineers, please design a structure that if you do all these analysis, you will be right on. And so here, uh, you see I, the optimization problem, how do you formulate the objective function you want to compute the loss hazard curve for all the properties of your structure. Here I consider the single degree of freedom with only three parameters to simplify. Initial stiffness, yield strength, strain hardening ratio. So I have a single degree of freedom structure that I want to design. I want to compute what is the optimum K0 FYB so that I match exactly a certain loss hazard curve that I like. So I'm going to create the square of the discrepancy between the loss hazard curve that I get, let's say the blue one, 
and the target one. And I want to iterate until that discrepancy becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? So you see you want to minimize the discrepancy between the target loss hazard curve and the one that you compute from your current structural design. Subjected to equality constraint and inequality constraint. So now I'm going to show you the example that we did. <coughs> we, we did a lot of work on the Humboldt Bridge. So we took the longitudinal direction of the Humboldt Bridge, replaced it by an equivalent nonlinear single degree of freedom system so that it's semi-realistic. So now imagine, and we modeled it with Manigoto Pinto, so it's the longitudinal direction of the bridge, the mass of the bridge, the strain hardening ratio, we assume that we know it, 10%, damping ratio 2%. Now what we did, again here we played again. You see, if you give values of K0, and Fy, Fy and K0, for each value you get a different loss hazard curve. It's very costly, you have to go through all these steps that I told you, and for each values of K0 and Fy you have a loss hazard curve. And now what we did, we selected the optimum in advance, we cheated so to speak, we, we selected a value of K0 and Fy that we call the optimum that produce the loss hazard curve that we want. And so these are the parameters that we choose in advance, the optimum, right? so that you, we know the exact solution and see if we can recover it. And now we started with some values pretty far away as a starting point. And use OpenSysNOP to see if OpenSysNOP can start from this, iterate, and arrive at this. And now there is a little movie. Can you just show us the next one? Two, there is two slides, this one. So here you see the objective function, here in terms of the initial stiffness, the strength. If I zoom on this, you see it here. So that's exactly what I told you, the objective function, the constraint the starting point, and here you see again the objective function, the contour line, you see the demand hazard curve corresponding to the true solution, to the optimum design, and the loss hazard curve, and now I'm going to iterate, you see I start from a point that is here, here, I'm getting this demand hazard curve, this loss hazard curve, and now you go to the second point, Right here, I'm much closer, third, fourth, fifth, and I, I am now matching the loss hazard curve that I want, uh, and I have the recovered the optimum here. So that's, uh, I will stop here. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I took that's a little bit. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Um, we'll take one question. How do you avoid uh, getting trapped in local optimization minimum, let's say? You, you, you cannot avoid because uh, any, any optimizer like uh, SNOP, these are local optimizers. If you want to do global optimization, there are methods, you know, where they, for example, they couple local optimizers, but it's a... It's a it's but you understand very, what I'm talking about? because. I can imagine like a multi-space uh, environment sure. where you have local minimum and you get trapped in one of those. Sure. So the, the answer to this is if you are a rigorous person in optimization, you, know you want to formulate everything mathematically, you want to prove unicity and global minimum and so on, then you cannot solve a real world engineering problem. Well, it's going to take several hundred years. Mm -hmm. But the philosophy here is if you can improve an initial design, you know, significantly, that's already a success. Even if you have fallen in a local minimum, and maybe there is another local minimum that is deeper, uh, it's still useful. It's kind of the philosophy. Yeah,